middle of the night to her cow's abnormal newer. She went outside to check and saw me walking into the fish pond. I didn't wake up after entering the water. She barely pulled me out of the water before I fell into the deep part of the pond. Okay, so the stream has gone hot. Is it still going? I don't know. Weird. Mm -hmm. I was shaking uncontrollably. She had to carry me inside. It took half an hour to wake me up. When she asked what happened, I apparently half-consciously answered. I was following the pony. The origins of the Kelpie aren't exactly known for sure, but there's one prevailing theory. Horses are dangerous animals. And they kill more people each year than you'd probably realize. People fall off them and break their necks all the time, and their kicks are easily strong enough to rupture your insides. On top of that, messing around with a nobleman's horse back in the day could have landed you in some pretty hot water. This legend might have started as a cautionary tale which parents told their children, the moral being, never touch a horse you don't know. Ironically, the story of the Kelpie probably saved quite a few of our ancestors from dying young. Who knows, maybe you owe your very existence to the Kelpie folktale. As a little bonus, I've left a link to a small but nicely drawn comic about the Kelpie. It's down in the description. If you find yourself relaxing on a Hawaiian beach at night, be wary of the sound of distant drums and footsteps. It's said that on certain sacred nights, the Huaka Ipo, or night marchers, patrol the coastline. They're the spirits of ancient Hawaiian warriors, still carrying out their martial duties in the afterlife. They most often appear just after sunset, or right before dawn, and are known to kill anyone that witnesses their march. If their torches are in view, then it's already too late to run. Your best chance of survival is to play dead. Avoid making eye contact at all costs. They'll notice your stares and butcher you. Some say that placing your face into the sand or dirt is your best chance of appeasing them, as they view this as a mark of respect. If one of your ancestors marches in their ranks, then they'll spare your life. So, if Hawaiian blood runs through your veins, you may be one of the chosen few who can watch the marchers as they pass by. Then again, are you really willing to take that risk? In Norwegian folklore, Draugr are the ghosts of sailors who perished at sea. They continue to sail the waters on the splintered remains of their ships, appearing on stormy nights to drag down the boats of the living. Anyone foolish enough to set sail at night risks hearing their distinctive wailing and screaming, the calling card of the Draugr. Then, after making all this noise, it appears. A contorted, fish-like face, soulless, black eyes, a gaping mouth monstrous in size. As quickly as it manifests, it drags down the sailor's ship below the waves, all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. All the crew drown, and their unfortunate souls are doomed to resurface as Draugen, cursed to drift across the ocean forevermore, searching for fresh victims of their own. In one particular folk story, a Norwegian sailor tries to escape this fate when he encounters a Draugen on a nightmare voyage. The man knew that the only way to survive an encounter with a Draugen was to make it to shore before it could reach you. The man does indeed make it back to dry land, but the Draugen continues to pursue him anyway. In desperation, the man sprints to a nearby churchyard and begs the spirits of the dead to protect him. In the morning, there's no trace of him left but all of the graves are completely empty and covered in seaweed. Perhaps this story started circulating after a mass grave robbery took place. It's hard to say. 
Whatever the case, these demonic mermen are certainly enough to keep me on dry land for a good long while. People who have followed this channel for a while now probably saw this one coming. Much like Wendigos, I've covered skimwalkers a fair amount in previous story narrations. They're pretty popular, and for good reason. These creatures are the stuff of nightmares. A large proportion of Navajo people firmly believe in skimwalkers, and are cautious when it comes to talking about them. It's said that even discussing the creatures attracts their attention. If that's true, it's a bloody good thing that I don't live in America. <laughs> skimwalkers are a type of Native American witch. More specifically, a shaman or witch doctor that murdered somebody close to them during their lifetime. They often appear as animals though distorted and tattered replicas. It's best not to think of this as shape-shifting. It's more that they're inhabiting the skin of the creatures they've killed. The more experienced the skinwalker is, the more likely they're to appear in a convincing form. It's not impossible for them to take on the skin of a human, either. It's rare for a skinwalker to kill without a motive, and generally, they try to keep to themselves. When they do wish to take a life, however, they tend to isolate their prey. They can go about doing this in a number of different ways. One of their deadliest tricks is to call out to you in a familiar voice, luring you towards them. Their vocabulary is often limited, however, and some even say... Oh, hello, Delta. What's up? Thank you. That was nice of you. That they can only repeat the last phrase that their previous victim screamed before they died. As such, one of the most common ways is Thanks. to count things like... Help um, me. Oh, there's well. some weird marks, I'm pretty sure, from the other colored pencils. Oh, that's okay, don't worry about it. No worries, no requirements either. Just if you feel like it, you know? No worries. Meaning bystander might run deep into the wood. Hope your day's been alright. to see if anyone needs help, only to be met with a skimwalker. They aren't invincible, however, and as such, they're unlikely to attack groups of people. Nice, good to hear. Chill Mondays are good. Should a skimwalker believe the odds are against them in any situation, they'll likely flee. If you ever spook a dog, or a deer, or coyote, and see it stand up on its back two legs and run away, you'll know what just crossed your path. I won't go into any more detail about them here, since I've covered them so much in the past, but I just couldn't leave them off this list. If you'd like to hear more about them, I'd recommend checking out the Benny story that I narrated a while back. I'll leave a link to it down below. The Benny story, let's see. Interesting. Number one. When I was 14, our family dog, a German Shepherd named Benny, went missing. My older brother and I had taken him out for a walk in the Arizona woods that surround our house. The dog disappeared out of eyeshot and didn't return when we called for him. He must have looked for a solid three hours before the sun started to set and we had to jog back to our house. 
we told our dad that Benny had disappeared on our usual walking trail. Well, old Benny was part of the family, so my dad and uncle went out with a couple of flashlights in search of him, reassuring my brother and I that they'd find him. Despite their reassurances, I honestly didn't hold out much hope. We live in the middle of nowhere, with vast woodland almost surrounding the house. Even though Benny knew this area like the back of his paw, if he'd wandered too far out in those woods, he could have easily lost his bearings. It's possible he caught sight of a critter and chased it too deep in. I was distressed, of course, because I loved that dog like a brother, and so did, well, my brother. We waited alone in the house for a couple more hours. I have no idea how to... Um... Well, that'll require research, I guess, but... Have a BRB sc uh, screen, because... I need to go to the bathroom really bad, but... Um... Maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll make one on a post-it note, sure. Um... Hold on, why are there scissors here? Um, there's the post-its. Post-it, notes it, nosed it. Um, I'm missing something. I'm missing my pencil. Uh, it doesn't matter, I have colored pencils, yes I know. But, uh, I do need to do this. Oh, there it is. There. Okay. <coughs> Um, B, R, B. There we go. <laughs> Isn't that a professional Be Right Back screen? I'm so glad. <laughs> okay. I can I 
following our elders return. It was a fair trek down to where we'd lost sight of him, but every minute we had to wait was disheartening. You can imagine my jubilation when I heard a dog's bark coming from the surrounding woods. My first assumption was that Hi our there. uncle and dad Thank had you. found him. Thank you very much. But when I peered out of my bedroom window overlooking the front, I saw nothing. Our family members weren't anywhere to be seen. Had Benny found his way back by himself? Did I just imagine that barking? I called my brother over, telling him I just heard what must have been Benny out by the trees. As he stared out of the window beside me, a second bark rang out, much louder than the first. Actually, a little too loud. Being a German shepherd, Benny had a strong bark, but this seemed almost unnatural and almost seemed to reverberate. The tree line where it was coming from was a fair distance from the house, but it sounded like he was just outside the window. After an interval of a few seconds, another identical bark. It might sound odd to say this, since dog barks sound pretty alike, but it was almost too similar to the last one. There was a static quality to it, almost like an old recording. Then came a whimpering, like an injured dog would make. I knew that my brother thought this was strange as well, as he shot me an unnerved look and told me to stay put whilst he went out with my dad's rifle to investigate. If Benny was hurt out there, we'd have to help him pronto. I kept a watchful eye and ear from my bedroom, and my brother ventured outside, cautiously approaching the tree line. About ten meters away, I saw him freeze on the spot, shining his flashlight at a specific point in the woods. He lowered it and aimed his rifle at the same spot. All this time, I'm hollering at him from my bedroom window, asking what the hell's going on. He doesn't answer me, just stands there for the longest moment. Then he pulls a 180 and hightails it back inside. I ask him what the hell that was all about. He says that as he got close to the tree line, he saw old Benny all right, tail wagging and everything. Gave him a little, come here boy. The dog wouldn't budge. It wanted my brother to go to him. When my brother shone his flashlight on Benny, he knew something wasn't right with the big guy. Aside from his moving tail, he was standing stiff and rigid and looked more like a taxidermy statue. His sides didn't even expand or contract to breathe. And his eyes, they weren't dog-like. He said it was more like looking into the eyes of a human stranger. They were large, wide, and full of white. That might be difficult to picture, but he said you wouldn't have to know what Benny looked like to know this was unnatural for a dog. That's when he raised his rifle. And the damn thing stood up on its back legs and sprinted off deep into the woods, running just like a man. Since it looked like Benny, he couldn't take the shot. He claims to this day that the thing was trying to lure us out into those woods, projecting its voice and trying to catch us off guard, that it hadn't yet learned the little nuances of acting like an authentic dog. Our dad and uncle returned home about 15 minutes later. They'd found Benny's mauled body by a lake a couple of miles out. They said he must have been there for hours. Number 2 Not much is known about skinwalkers, other than the obvious, since the Navajo generally don't like to talk about them. It's said that even discussing the creatures attracts their attention though I think their reluctance has more to do with not letting outsiders in on their native lore. Well, that being said, a part Navajo friend of mine has filled me in on some of the stories he's heard about the creatures, and quite frankly, they're pretty chilling. He's mostly apathetic when it comes to the whole native secrecy deal. He told us a story that happened to his uncle when he was only 21 and out on a camping trip with a few buddies of his. It was an annual trip they made to honor a friend of theirs who died young a couple of years prior. For the sake of this story, we'll say the friend's name was Jeremy. The rest of the guys had ventured out to those woods every year.
them with Jeremy having passed away, they kept the tradition very much alive. It was early one morning during the trip, and my friend's uncle had woken up before his buddies. He got out of the tent to take a little stroll around the area, stretch his legs, and appreciate the beautiful nature that surrounded him. He walks for about five minutes, and other than his friends, he's miles away from the closest human beings around. He's hearing nothing but birdsong and the breeze. But the calm atmosphere suddenly shifts, and the air around him started to feel heavy. The sound of the birds around him seemed to dissipate, and things became eerily and unusually silent. A strange sense of dread overcame him, and compelled him to turn around. There, standing on a raised area, was Jeremy. More accurately, it was Jeremy's face, seemingly superimposed on a weird, crooked body. He just stood there, waving at him. Looking at Jeremy's face closely, his jaw was slack, and his eyes were colorless and glazed over, like there was a thin, translucent film covering them. His expression never changed. His limbs were torn and bloody. My friend's uncle sprinted back to the tent and alerted the others. They knew the stories of skinwalkers, and wasted no time in packing up and cutting their trip short. Now, some people might be compelled to think that this was Jeremy's spirit, coming to hang out with his old camping buddies one last time. My friend's uncle knows otherwise. He says this was a malevolent entity. It was likely native to the area, and had seen the boys on a previous trip. That's how it knew to take Jeremy's face. Number three. I don't belong to any UFO groups or anything like that, but this actually happened to me. I've told a few trusted friends about it, but never bothered writing it down. I'll try to relate it as accurately as memory allows. In 1990, while I was working as a paramedic in Anchorage, we got called out on an alarm for a man having a heart attack at the state jail in Eagle River. He was a native man in his 70s. And after I got him stabilized with IVs, O2, and cardiac drugs, my partner and I began to transport him to the native hospital in Anchorage. En route to the hospital, I had time to talk to this gentleman, who was an Aleut from the native village of Port Graham, a remote village on the lower end of Cook Inlet. Well, as usual with me, the topic eventually drifted to hunting and fishing, and I casually mentioned to him that I was once weathered in at the upper lagoon of Dogfish Bay only a few miles from his home in Port Graham. The lagoon was about as beautiful and wild a place as I had ever seen in my 35 years in Alaska. Well, when I said that I'd spent some time in dogfish, this old man sat up on the gurney and grabbed me by the front of my shirt. He got right up to my face and said, Did it bother you? With that question, the hair stood up on the back of my head. You see... I knew exactly what he was talking about. I said, yes. Did you see it? was his next question. No, I replied. Did you see it? No, but my brother's seen it. He had chased him. This old Aleut and I were talking about the same thing, but we never used the word skimwalker or Bigfoot or legend or anything like that. We just both knew what we were talking about. Allow me to explain. In August of 73, three of us were bow hunting for goats and blackies in what was then a remote wilderness of Lower Cook Inlet. A sudden storm forced us to take shelter in Dogfish Bay Lagoon. We beached our skiff and let the tide run her dry. After a dinner of broiled salmon, we turned in to our tent. Back in those days, the best tent I had was a dark green canvas job with a centerfold and no windows or floor. We left the fire burning and cleared the pots and pans so not to attract bears during the night. The sky was clear, but the wind was howling through the old growth timber that lined the shore. Sometime around 2am, my friend Dennis woke me up by squeezing my leg. I could dimly see his face in the tent. 
His finger was across his lips. I listened. Then I heard it. A step. A man was quietly walking outside our tent, taking very deliberate steps. When you spend as much time in the great outdoors as we all had, you become intimately familiar with the sounds of the wilderness. This wasn't a natural sound. It definitely wasn't a bear, or any other kind of animal for that matter. Scenes from the movie Deliverance flashed in my mind. We woke Joe, the third member of our party, with the same leg grab and finger to the lips. The walking, or rather sneaking, continued until it had half circled our tent. And then all was quiet, except for the wind. We had our bows and the O6 leaning against the tree outside our tent, so somehow we talked Joe into belly crawling out of the tent to get the rifle. We were scared shitless, I tell you. The next day and night, the storm continued to blow. We saw several black bears on the salmon stream at the head of the lagoon during the evening hunt, but had no chance for a shot. We didn't talk about what happened the previous night. Too embarrassed, I guess, to be scared by a black bear that sounded like a man. We got back to camp early, built a big fire, sat around it and ate dinner until about midnight. In August, there's still some light in the sky at about 10 or 11. I recall we were all embarrassed about being afraid of the coming night. We had a flashlight and the rifle in the tent between us, locked and loaded. I finally dozed off, but woke right up when Dennis squeezed my leg. The illuminated hands on my watch showed it was 2.30 a.m. Joe was already sitting up and had the rifle in his hands. I heard the first step, no more than ten feet away from the back of the tent. It was moving slowly. Then we heard another, and another. Whatever this was, it sounded like it was walking on two feet. It made the same semicircle around the tent. When we finally mustered enough courage, we crawled out of the tent and turned the flashlight on. We saw nothing. No tracks. Nothing. The third night, we decided if it bothered us again, we'd come out of the tent shooting. We were actually scared. It never came back on the third night, and the following day, we had a break in the weather and got the heck out of there. Never told anybody about the experience for several years until about 1979, when I happened to be reading an old Alaskan sportsman magazine published in 1935. In the letters to the editor, a woman wrote that she recently found a letter written by some distant relative of hers who was a schoolteacher at the cannery in Portlock Bay, a rugged fjord adjacent to Dogfish Bay. The year was 1905. She quoted from the letter. It said that the cannery employed a small group of Aleuts from a small village in Portlock Bay during salmon season. Their camp was about a mile from the cannery buildings. One day, all of the Aleuts moved out of the village and paddled their bidicasts back to Port Graham. The letter said that the Aleuts claimed a hairy man was bothering them and frightened them to the point where they had to leave. I've since done some research into the subject and found written histories of natives from Seldovia to Port Graham being frightened and bothered by something. They even have a native name for it. It doesn't translate into English very well. These accounts mostly take place during the first half of the 1900s and are native related. Not all of them though. I talked to one white guy who, in 1968, got the bejeeba scared out of him while coming down an Aldachoke gully while on a goat hunt in Portlock. Most of these accounts precede the Bigfoot hype that appeared in the 60s and 70s in the Northwest. Me and my buddies will never know what was circling our tent those nights, but it sure as hell wasn't an animal. We can tell you that much. Anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Number 4 
My roommates told me this story a few times, and I want to see if anyone else has had similar experiences. As he tells it, he was driving home super late at night, maybe 3 or 4 a.m., in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, both times this occurred. The first time, he was driving alone on a road that has an open field to the left of it, when out of nowhere, a black figure on all fours bounced up out of the field and across the road in front of his car. As soon as the figure got to the other side of the road, it stops with inhuman quickness, turns around, and looks directly at my roommate. He described the figure as looking simian, completely black except for the face. The creature's face was a stark white human face. Not white as in Caucasian, but white as snow. And this happened again a few weeks later, but this time the creature was sitting in a tree. As his car approached it, it climbed down the tree, again with inhuman quickness, bounded across the road, stopped on a dime, turned around and made eye contact with him. This time, he had a friend in the car who also saw it and began freaking out. It was the same exact thing as the first time. A simian, black body, with a snow-white, expressionless human face. My roommate, the ever the curious one, turned the car around and began searching for the creature, but it was nowhere to be seen. Could this be skinwalker-related? Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. So thank you to everyone who voted on my Twitter poll for the next video, and uh, coming up next will be some kind of unsolved... So, <laughs> Number one. I grew up in a town on the Gulf of Mexico. Our neighborhood was next to an absolutely huge field, and on the other side of the field was the Gulf itself. My childhood home was laid out where my bedroom and my parents' bedroom were on opposite sides of the living room, which is where the front door was. I normally stayed up late, much later than my parents at least. They didn't mind much, as I didn't get into much trouble just playing video games. Anyway, I had fallen asleep playing Super Mario RPG on the SNES, mid-battle and all, when I woke up to my dad calling me into the living room. So I got up and walked out of my room. Every light in the house was off. I called out, Dad? I don't recall the exact verbiage used, but he called me by name and was calling me to him. The living room was completely empty, and, as I said, without a single light on. I stood there, my eyes peering around the room, which was dimly lit from a nearby street lamp seeping through the blinds. Dad? Again, he calls out to me. This time, though, his voice came from beyond the front door. In retrospect, of course, something was wrong. But, as a young boy, being called in the middle of the night by their father's voice, my first thought was that he obviously needed my help for some reason. I approached the front door slowly, very slowly, partially out of confusion and partially out of grogginess. As I approached, my dad called to me again, then again, and a third time, each call beckoning in a friendly yet urgent tone. I was within reach of the doorknob now. I stood there. At this point, I felt something was a little off. Maybe I was sleepwalking, or caught in some vapor of sleep or something. I paused for a few seconds to really drink in my surroundings, feel my environment, so to speak. 
and this gave me some time to truly take in the details. I was perceptive. I was awake. There was no mistaking it. Dad? Silence. Dad? Then I heard him once more, stern this time, like he sounded when I was in trouble. Get out here, now. Oh shit, it's serious, I think to myself. I reach for the door. Son, what are you doing? It was my mother, right behind me. Her voice, in contrast to everything I was feeling in that moment, terrified me. It was the most startled I had ever been in my life. But that record wouldn't last long. I replied to her inquiry. Dad's outside, calling me. I think he needs me. She simply said, Dad's in the bedroom asleep. This phrase is one of the most vivid memories I have. Just thinking about it has me covered in chills. The record shattered. This was by far the most terrifying single moment in my life. I know for a fact I wasn't dreaming. I don't sleepwalk. I remember waking up. I remember it very clearly. And then, right after that, was when I had first heard that voice luring me outside. Maybe that's what woke me up in the first place. I had no response to the bombshell my mother had just dropped on me. I was just emotionally exhausted by fear. You know, that sickly, exhausted feeling you get when you receive absolutely terrible news. I simply muttered, good night, shuffled back to my room and laid there on the floor until I passed out from emotional exhaustion. I've never heard anything like that since. I've told this story for 20 years now the exact same way. It's one of the clearest memories I have from my childhood. I, of course, don't know 100% that this was a skimwalker. I have no idea what the fuck it was, though I have heard that they do employ these kind of tactics to lure you into their sick traps. All I do know for sure, though, is that it was something, and it almost tricked me. Number 2 a few years ago now, I was out on a camping trip with a couple of my buddies, one of whom was of Navajo descent. It was just a few guys getting away from the real world for a while, escaping into nature. The first night was great. We set up camp in a clearing, had a few beers and shared a few laughs. Maybe one too many beers. The second night, though, is where things took a turn. We went to bed fairly early, since we were all pretty tired from the previous night. I woke up at around 1am, since I desperately needed to take a leak. I got out of the tent and headed towards the tree line. I finished doing my business and turned back towards the tent. I got a couple of steps, and that's when I see it. On the opposite side of the clearing, there's a deer but it's walking across the field on its back legs, bipedal like a human. Now, I know deer occasionally rise up on their hind legs, but this was completely different. This thing was strolling like he was heading to the office or something. It turns its head to face me, and it freezes. We're just staring at each other for what felt like an eternity, the creature still standing tall. If we were side by side, it'd be towering over me. Eventually, I snap out of my trance and start shouting for the guys to wake up. And this deer thing just takes off, sprinting into the trees, still on two legs, letting out a horrific screech that sounded like a little girl crying, but sort of corrupted, like there was static from a TV set in its voice, if that makes sense. The two others clamber out of the tent, asking what the hell was wrong and what that noise was. Now I know I wasn't going crazy. They had both heard it too. I explain to them what I had just seen, and my Navajo friend goes ghostly pale. 
we should go, he says. Let's pack up and head for the truck. Now. Me and my other friend are pretty freaked out at this point and don't question his plan. I knew what he was thinking. I'd heard of skimwalkers before. Only I'd always thought that they were just Native American myths. That was no longer the case. As we're packing everything away in the bags, he tells us more details about skimwalkers and how once you've seen them, you don't want to stick around for long. They'll come back for you, and they might not come back alone. We finally get back to the truck, but our relief's cut short when we see a dog by the vehicle. Now this is weird. What the hell is this dog doing out in the woods all alone? After what just happened, we're understandably on edge, but we calm ourselves down and slowly get closer to it. It's facing the truck, so it can't see us as we're approaching. But as soon as it hears us, its body goes as hard as a rock. It doesn't instantly turn to look at what the noise behind it was, like any normal dog would. Instead, it slowly turns its head to face us, before turning its whole body. There was something disturbingly human about its face. It had giant eyes, too big for its head. You know how a dog's eyes are just dark blobs? This one had eyes just like a person. You could see the large whites with the colored iris around the pupils and everything. And they were wide and defensive. Its face was frozen in that snarling position, brandishing its teeth. I don't know whether it knew that we weren't going to attack, but it simply backed up a little, turned and scurried away. That was it. We all threw our stuff in the truck, hopped in and hightailed it out of there. As we're driving, my Navajo friend says, Did you guys notice it didn't have a tail? We questioned what he meant, and apparently that was a sign of a skimwalker. We got back to his folks place, and his father performed some sort of ritual on us. He didn't question our story at all, and we spent the night at theirs. The next morning, his parents refused to let us leave without taking a small totem-like thing with us. Allegedly, it would keep the things at bay. Seems to have worked so far, though I can't help but check outside my bedroom window each night before I go to sleep just in case they've somehow tracked me down. Number three. This takes place in the Chaska Mountains in the 80s. My friend was about six years old and was up in the mountains for a family reunion. The cabin they were staying at was in a meadow with a stone well near the tree line. They spent the day doing the typical reunion things i.e. three-legged races, flag football, and whatnot. The sun starts setting, and the family retires to the cabin. The older people plan to sleep in the two bedrooms, and the kids would sleep in the cots in the living room. All was well, and the kids were tucked into bed. My friend, Sandra, feels uneasy and is struggling to go to sleep. She's tossing and turning, unable to shake this really weird feeling. Suddenly, her feeling immediately turns to fear as she hears something big, something heavy, making its way across the porch. Sandra fears that it may be a bear looking for food. She could make out the shadow of something large and black as it passed the window. It's making its way to the door, and she sees that the family hasn't locked it. Sandra watches the door, too scared to move or even scream, and she sees the doorknob rattling back and forth. Whatever's trying to open the door succeeds. The room floods with the most putrid and horrific stench, and she sees a large human hand make its way through the door. She finally summons her strength and screams for her father. Her dad runs in and sees Sandra pointing at the door. He also sees the hand and yells for his brother to grab the gun. Whatever was at the door 
runs. It was a full moon, and in the moonlight, they see the creature run across the yard. Her dad's brother, with a rifle in his hands, looks through the scope and sees the creature crouching behind the well. Sandra's father assumes it's a bear and tells his brother to take the shot. He pulls the trigger and hears the bullet ricochet off the well. All thought of this being a bear is dismissed instantly when the creature stands on two feet and runs towards the tree line. They never saw the creature again. Number four. This occurred in Maine two years ago when I was 18. Every summer, my family and I go to a camp in Dedham. It's about a three hour drive from my house. The camp itself is about a half hour from the nearest town. I've been going to this camp my entire life since my family owns it and have never had an incident like this happen before. I was watching TV in the middle of the night. Both of my brothers and my parents had gone to bed. I heard a noise coming from the kitchen and realized that our dogs needed to go outside to do their business. So I took my brother's two pit bulls and my appen pincer, a tiny dog, outside after turning the porch light on. I walked around to the front yard and let the dogs off their leashes. It's so incredibly dark in the woods in Maine that the porch light really only illuminated the porch itself and nothing else, so I tried to keep an eye on them as best I could. I was momentarily distracted when I saw a wild bird out on the lake. When I looked back, I saw that the pit bulls were both looking at something in the woods. I couldn't see what it was, but I assumed they had seen a squirrel or a raccoon. It was then that I realized I couldn't see my little appen pincer, Alfie, anywhere. She's an awfully small dog, and she's completely black. I called her name a few times, and heard some soft whimpering coming from the woods, right at the spot where the pit bulls were staring. I took a couple of steps in that direction, and called out her name again, worried that she may have gotten her paw stuck between the rocks, or gotten stuck in a snake hole. Suddenly... I felt something moving behind me. I whipped around and looked down, and it was Alfie. She had been staying close to me the whole time, I just hadn't seen her. So naturally, I was now thinking, if Alfie's here, then what the fuck's in the woods? I took another step forward, and the pit bulls began to growl. They were slowly advancing, and were now on either side of me looking right into the blackness of the woods. I quickly picked up Alfie and began to back up very slowly. I'm not sure what I thought was there, but there are lots of animals out in Maine, and I figured that the pit bulls knew better than I did. Right as I turned around, I heard the absolute most bone-chilling thing I've ever heard in my life. Coming from the direction of the woods, I heard something call Alfie's name. It sounded as if they were trying to mimic me, but it was just all wrong. The voice sounded really distorted, and it almost seemed to wail. I freaked the fuck out, and ran inside with the dogs. My camp is essentially a log cabin overlooking a lake, and our nearest neighbor, whose family, lives at least half a mile in the opposite direction of where this thing was. I've no idea what was out in those woods, though I have heard of skimwalkers playing similar tricks to lure people into the darkness. Number 5 Last October, I was visiting my grandparents out in Shiprock, New Mexico. Many Navajo people, including my own family, are very reluctant to speak about skimwalkers. Hey, I've been there. I also live in New Mexico. Because it's commonly believed that talking about them attracts their attention. However, I grew up away from the Navajo Nation and was very naive about the subject. When it came to skimwalkers, I was an absolute skeptic. 
My mum used to tell me a story about how back in the 80s, she and my aunt saw a skimwalker just outside their driveway under a street light. She described it as a black dog with dirty fur, a twisted, noodle-like front leg, and these unnatural eyes with a soft burnt glow to them. Me, being my logical self, doubted every word, but I never said my doubts aloud. But these doubts totally changed last year, when I went to my grandparents' house. My family and I had just finished going to the carnival at the Navajo Nation Fair, and decided to call it a night. The house was close enough where we could just walk home in less than ten minutes. When we got there, it was around 9pm at night, and we stayed up past two in the morning, catching up about family affairs and the local news. It was during that time that I decided to open my mouth and blurt out the question, Hey, are skimwalkers real? You shouldn't be speaking about that, my grandma said, with almost a disturbed yell in her voice. Not wanting to push the discomfort any further, we all decided to go to bed. Now, the trailer is pretty old, and it was a really nice night, so we slept with the windows open and the screens covering them to prevent bugs coming in. Everyone had fallen asleep except me. Just as I was finally getting relaxed, I started to hear something moving outside. I get up from the couch and start wandering over to the kitchen window. All of the rooms have the lights out, so the only visible light that I can see is from the porch light out the front. I take a quick scan of outside. From the porch light, all I can see is the dusty ground and the vehicles that my family drove, along with some old metal trash cans that stood beside the road. Looking for a good five seconds, I wasn't able to see anything, so I was getting ready to turn around and walk back to bed, thinking it was just a stray cat or something. Only having taken two steps, I hear what sounds like a distorted scream coming from outside, definitely close by. Fear rising, I look outside again, and there I see it. A coyote-like figure was staring at my direction from behind the cars, just outside of the reach of the porch light. Only it looked absolutely wrong, and gave off an evil vibe just from looking at it. It was grey with very disheveled hair, and a horrific orange-reddish glow to its eyes. I noped the hell out of there back to the bedroom. It was at that moment I had also begun to notice an awful stench in the air. It smelled of rotting meat. I started trying to wake up my mum, whose response was, It's almost 3am, what do you want? I tell her there's something outside. Now annoyed, she then says, Ugh, oh, it's probably just a stray animal. It's the res. Animals wander all the time at night. She obviously wasn't getting the drift of what I was saying, so I screamed, There's some Blair Witch Project shit going on outside, Ma. That got her attention. And then we both heard it. The thing outside started making more of those dreadful screams and sounded as if it was thrashing around on the ground outside. Both her and I got up and looked outside the window, and the coyote thing was making its way to the front door. It walked with an odd limp and dragged its back right leg as if it was handicapped. We could hear it start scratching against the door and making this odd, muffled moaning sound. My mum went and got my dad, and they both started shouting in Navajo all sorts of words, telling the thing to go away and saying it's not welcome here. Well, all this commotion was enough to wake up the rest of the trailer, and they all came into the hallway. The only thing my mum did was turn to them, and simply said, Skimwalker, while proceeding to point at the door. Apparently, they already knew exactly what to do, as my grandfather got a handgun out the drawer and a bag of ashes. He coated a few bullets in the ash, loaded them into the handgun, and went straight to the door. 
yelling out more Navajo that was too fast for me to comprehend, he swung open the door and fired twice. Nothing. The thing managed to escape before my grandpa could even put a bullet in it. Next thing I know, my aunts and my parents are freaking out about what just happened, saying stuff like, what if it comes back tomorrow? It saw us, does that mean we're targets now? Afterwards, my grandparents calmed everyone down, saying we'll be fine, and to go back to bed. Morning comes, and my grandparents call over one of their neighbours, and explain to them what happened. Apparently, one of them was a medicine man, who used to partake in a Navajo ceremony, used for healing and curing sickness. He blessed each family member, and the grounds outside. Today, I'm very convinced that what I saw was a skimwalker. I still plan on going back to visit my family, and to return to the Northern Navajo Nation Fair. I just hope I never have an awful experience like that again. In the Dark Number one. I'm the sort of person who's skeptical of any claims regarding the existence of the paranormal. My wife claims to see ghosts and says that she's an empath, and I'll concede that she's a very good guesser regarding other people's emotions and the history of places and families. But I can't accept her statements as fact because they're not empirically provable. With that said, you can believe me or not, but what I'm about to say is something that even I have a lot of trouble disbelieving. I can't say I've had any supernatural experiences in my life, but there are several things that happened when I was quite young that I simply can't explain. At around 18 months old, I had either a memory or a very vivid imagination of my life before birth. I was floating up in the sky, with no land in any direction. In front of me was a kindly, middle-aged Native American man, wearing a plain white robe. He asked me if I was ready, and when I said yes, I somehow descended and experienced my own birth. I know this all sounds crazy, and I guess it could all be chalked up to me having a dream, but as I got older, things got weirder. When I was about six or seven years old, I started getting very distinct mental images of something extremely disturbing. What I saw was a tanned, mummified-looking, emaciated, dead face. The eyes were glassy, but somehow horribly alive, and the lips and nose were shrunken. The creepiest thing about the face was the too wide smile and a full set of very white teeth. When I was nine or ten, I read for the first time about an expedition in Antarctica where several ill-fated members of an expeditionary group died and were left behind. Their bodies were recovered in the 20th century, and the article I was reading had images of them. I had never seen a frozen body before, but as soon as I saw those pictures, I immediately correlated what I was reading with the thing I saw in those mental images earlier in my life. From that point onwards, I started having almost real waking visions of something that is basically my worst nightmare. It's hard to explain, more than just in my mind's eye, and yet not exactly as if they were actually in front of me. It was an eight or nine foot tall frozen corpse completely naked, with long arms and legs. It had the same face as the thing I had seen before, with shrunken features, 
only now it had a full body that was just as emaciated and mummified as the head and neck were. I only ever saw it on cloudy days in the late fall or winter, and always when it was between me and a window, so it was sort of backlit. It never made any motion to do anything. It just stared down at me with that horrible grin. In high school, I finally learned what this thing was. The Wendigo. For those of you who don't know, it's a mythical spirit creature in Algonquian legend. I was born in Connecticut and have about 1% Native American blood in me from 400 years ago. My first traceable ancestors in America came over shortly after the Mayflower, and one of them married a Native American woman. According to legend, the Wendigo was an evil spirit associated with starvation, the winter, and cannibalism. It either lured desperate people into eating their fellow humans during the winter, or possessed those who did resort to cannibalism. There are various stories about how the Wendigo looked, but most agree that it looks like a frozen corpse, generally taller than a human. And no, it doesn't have antlers like all those pictures you find via Google search. It can reportedly mimic human voices to lure the unwary into ambushes. Here's the thing. I experienced this before I even identified what the creature was or knew anything about the legends. Only after almost a decade of initially seeing the Wendigo did I come across the description of what it looked like. I've done some further research, and all of the information I found from various sources all concurs with what I saw. So... I am remotely linked to the Native Americans, with whom the legend originated. I've always had a deathly fear of dead bodies, especially mummified-looking ones. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I saw a creature from their stories long before I learned what I saw matched the traditional descriptions perfectly. I was and still am skeptical, but even I can't ignore these coincidences. I'm also a Christian and therefore am quite wary of claims regarding ghosts or the supernatural. But even so, this thing has stuck with me for years. I saw it earlier today, which is why I'm relaying this. Does anyone have any insight? I've considered seeking out a highly knowledgeable Algonquian person so I can figure out what to do. But I'm torn because I also have some reservations about that from a religious perspective. I promise this post is sincere. It sounds pretty fantastical, even to me. But I can't shake the feeling 
that this isn't just my imagination. Number two. If the company I work for found out I was writing this, I'd be canned immediately, so the who and where is intentionally vague. My name's T, and I deliver pizzas in a small rural town in northern Canada. The town I deliver in consists of about 25,000 people spread out along the foothills of a large mountain range. Many people who live here are farmers and loggers and shit like that. We have a small college here too, so there's a few students from out of town living here as well. Unlike most delivery companies, the one that I work for allows people outside of the city limits to order pizza up to 50 kilometers away from our location. Our companies like that because many of the town's residents actually live out of the city limits, in the foothills where the farms are. If you're 50 kilometers away, it'll cost an extra 20 bucks. That might seem outrageously high, but believe me, people really like their fucking pizza. Obviously, this causes me and other drivers to be gone for long periods of time on deliveries. To top it off, we're open until 5 a.m. every night. This combination of variables has caused me to witness and be part of some really fucked up and creepy shit during my several years working here. I don't know if other drivers in different parts of the world have the same issues, but here in northern Canada, there's a lot of really creepy and questionable stuff going on. I don't consider myself superstitious in any way, but some of the things I see, I can't explain. Before anyone calls me out and says I'm the only one experiencing these things, I'm not. Other drivers and I regularly hit the bar after shifts, and some of them are really messed up over some of the stuff they've seen. I know a guy who keeps a lamp on inside of his car at night because he's so terrified of the dark after something happened to him that he won't tell anyone about. Several months ago, I want to say December, I was working a close shift, and my delivery sector was mostly the outskirts of town along the foothills and further north. Being December in Canada, there was about six inches of fresh snow, and only the highways and artery roads were ploughed properly. Driving the rest of the roads would be a death wish if you didn't have the right gear and experience. Luckily for me, I have an AWD car, studded tyres and chains in case things go really south and I'm one of the more senior drivers. Being one of the few people with an all-wheels drive car, I was requested to take another pizza to the edge of our delivery range. Since the weather was so shitty, I called the number on my slip to confirm the address and to check that they still wanted the pizza. Getting the okay from what seemed like a cheery old lady, I set out down the highway. Just after I left the city limits, I noticed something alarming. All of the lights, including the street lights, were out. Assuming a power outage due to the storm, I give my boss a call to confirm it. He confirmed that it was indeed a sector-wide power outage. I attempt to give the lady I'm delivering to a call. Hey, this is your delivery driver. I'm noticing there's a power outage and was wondering if you still wanted the pizza despite these terrible conditions. She said that she did, and that she had a backup generator powering her house, so it'd be hard to miss. Knowing that I'd hooked a substantial tip, I put my blinker on and continued back down the highway. One thing you need to understand is just how dark it was. With it being later than midnight, and not a single light on, the only things illuminating my way were my subpar headlights. On top of that, it was snowing quite heavily. For reference, my field of vision looked exactly like this. If my car were to die, or my headlights were to go out, I'd be completely fucked. About ten kilometers down what I can only assume was a dirt road, underneath the mountains of snow in the middle of nowhere, I came across a car in the middle of the road with its hazards on. The car was diagonal across the road, and from its tracks, I could tell it tried to stop suddenly and lost control. Moving about 20 meters from the car, 
I couldn't see any signs of life, and noticed that the driver's side door was swung open and snow was piling inside the car. What alarmed me the most was what looked like blood on the inside of the window and all over the steering wheel as well. Upon clearing the snow from inside the car, it was obvious that there was a pretty brutal accident here, as there was blood all over the driver's side. My mediocre first aid training kicked in, and my first response was to call 911 and get an ambulance. kind of hard to get the same well it's not your phone that was doing it I actually didn't realize I could increase the resolution until last time yeah so that's the unfortunate part let's see what this one looks like this one's probably too big yeah it doesn't make too much oh it's gonna go way too slow let's go back to where we were there we go <laughs> no, I don't think it's just your phone. I had the resolution all messed up originally, so um, it's a little easier to see it now. Almost the way it looks in in person, so that's good. What's strange is like the camera sees the shines more than I can. Yeah, it's just interesting. out here. Pulling out my cell phone, the most cliche thing happened. There was no fucking service. Obviously there's no fucking cell service, I thought to myself. I'm out in the boonies. At this point, I'd completely forgotten about the delivery and was pretty intent on helping whoever fucked up out here in the boonies. The chance of another car coming by all the way out here this late was slim to none. So this was on me. I managed to figure out a couple of things. Firstly, the person obviously hit something really, really big. Like a moose or a large bear. The front of his car was almost entirely caved in, and both his front wheels were going in opposite directions. No way this thing was going anywhere. Drawing on past it. Thank you, Funky. I'm glad you think so. Um... I am not pleased, well, I'm a bit underwhelmed with how the blending looks, but hey, it's been a, a long time since I've done it, so I'm going to give a little bit of slack there. Um, just getting used, I, the one that I feel the worst about is how Yoshi looks, because the lines are harder to define, um, especially when the colored pencils got too thingy, so... You know, I'm once I get the last parts done, then I'm gonna you know do the additional details like the the scratched up face, and then um, I think there's gonna be a lot more shading on this guy because right now he's just way too plain. So that's what I plan on doing at least. So like, I would go in with this, and then add any of the shaded parts like this Experience. I actually yeah, that's what I'm hoping to do. Once this is done, um, I might start working on my 
<laughs> actual commission. So this was a good way to get an old piece finished as well as practice for the next piece because it's going to be colored pencil. So I'm excited about that because I enjoy colored pencil except for uh, obviously when the lead just keeps falling out. I actually started getting a callus where I was colored, where I was sharpening somewhere on this finger, like around this fold. <laughs> Actually, couldn't think of any animal that would do that much damage to a car like that. Secondly, after seeing a small trail of blood leading up the road, I assumed he probably went walking for help. This was where I made my first mistake. I followed the trail. Yeah, calluses, um, I mean, they're gonna happen, but they're weird. Like, one of them, I don't know if you can tell, but there's like a weird skin bubble? I don't know, right? You can kind of see it, it's like a little circle. Yeah. Very strange things on your skin when you're... Well, I also need to put more lotion on more often, because then, uh, then my skin starts to tear. Because it gets dry pretty quickly, so... Trail of blood on foot. Wanting to play the hero, I bundled up and set out into the storm with a small LED flashlight. I was concerned with whoever had injured themselves in this accident and getting to them safely. After about five minutes of walking, I realized that I had fucked up majorly as a singular thought went through my mind. What if whatever the driver hit is still out here? Judging by how big the impact on the car was, I can only assume that it was a grizzly bear or something unknown much larger. Dealing with a wounded animal in the middle of winter was something my pay grade didn't cover. After my moment of clarity, I decided my best bet was to get back in my car and get back to cell service to call 911. Not even after I had taken ten steps back towards my car, I heard what sounded like an entire tree being torn from the ground. The noise was absolutely deafening and threw me into a wild panic. I started sprinting back to my car but kept getting slowed down by the fact that my legs wouldn't coordinate with each other. After sprinting about five steps, I ate shit. Hard. I tripped face first into a snowbank and just laid there. Just as I was about to get up again, I heard it. I heard what sounded like heavy breathing coming from just out of my visual range. The noise was coming from where the accident happened and where my car was. At this point, something felt terribly wrong. That labored breathing sounded more animal than human, and was far too loud for any human to make. After what felt like an eternity, the breathing got louder, until suddenly I saw whatever was making that terrible noise. It had to be standing a minimum of eight feet tall, yeah, it was fucking standing. It was running on two feet, but every couple of steps it would stumble and start running like a bear. On four legs, it had sort of a loping gait, but then it would get back up on two feet and start running like a human. It was almost entirely covered in thick white fur and would have been almost impossible to spot had it not been covered in blood. Whether or not that was its blood or the driver of the car, I never stuck around to find out. Whatever that thing was, it was too distracted to see me, and sprinted right past me down the middle of the road, still breathing as heavy as ever. After what I thought was a solid ten minutes, I forced myself out of the snowbank and sprinted back to my car. When I got back to the vehicle, 
all four of my doors were wide open, and the pizza boxes were strewn all over the road. Not even thinking about the pizza or the delivery, I drove straight to the police station to report what happened. Officially, the police report states that the driver of the car collided with a large bear and that the bear dragged him off into the woods and devoured him. They never found his body, but did find what appeared to be a portion of his spine, almost 80 kilometers from where the accident happened. It was a really big thing in our town. People spent weeks searching for him. Whatever that thing was that the driver hit, it's still out there. If you guys enjoyed... Oh, well, um... I don't think it's changed. I mean, I would like to increase pricing, but I still am not the fastest person, so that's why um, I keep it on the lower-ish end. Oh, yeah, um, I could probably... Once I get this next one done, I could definitely take on yours if you're willing to uh, wait a little bit. That would be awesome. I can always use some more work, and I really appreciate that. This, I could probably get together with some of the other drivers and get some stories out of them over a few brews. If not, I have a few other really fucked up stories to share with you guys if you want. Either way, tip your delivery drivers. Number three. A few days ago, I was walking around the land near my home. It's a big field with two large hills and a plateau on top of both of them. It was around dusk, so the sun had just set but the moon wasn't out yet. Upon walking between the valley of sorts between the two hills, I saw something peculiar. A white, featureless human head, about 200 feet away. It was about four feet off the ground, and from what I could... Oh, October 24th. Um, hopefully I can... So much. So, this next one, I'm hoping to take, like, three or four months on, and then I could probably move to that one after. Oh, colored pencil, nice, okay. Yes, that'll be nice. And then, um, if you want, you can start uh, brainstorming what you'd like, and then we could... Um, go through concepts and stuff too. The concepting part is not hard to do. It's the, obviously, the execution part. Missing one of the great, oh, here it is. Uh, another one with messed up words, see? Eh? Wow. Tell it was pacing back and forth. It sounded like a horse when it walked, and when I went to pull out my flashlight, it growled at me. I immediately went home, deciding I didn't want anything to do with it that night. Today, a friend came over, so we decided to investigate during the daylight hours. We couldn't really find anything conclusive, but we did find some creepy things. I'll show you them in a moment. We heard howling and laughter like that of a child. I thought it sounded like the Skull Kid, to be honest. Oh, the sounds good. Okay, lying, yeah. That'll and be something cool. kept watching us from the trees. Again, we heard the sound of hooves. My friend said that she could smell sulfur. But I couldn't smell anything, although the inside of my nose was burning. Here are some photos of what we found in the area. The first three look like some form of graves. And this last one, well, I don't really know. But they were all over the place, 
and some looked as if they had been burned. If you guys could help me out by telling me what you think this was, I'd really appreciate it. Number four. Years ago, while hiking with my girlfriend in a very isolated area, we discovered we were being stalked. It was late in the day, not dark yet, but getting there. We were on a path with heavy woods on either side. We could hear movement in the woods, sounds of leaves rustling, branches snapping, etc. that seemed to parallel our path and matched our movements. However, we couldn't see anything, so we tested it. We stopped walking to listen, and the noise then stopped as well. Start and stop again, and it would just keep matching our movements. I left my girlfriend on the path, and... I just want to finish this, but I... Finished. I saw some. Blair, was the chicken sandwich not good? Is it a bad chicken sandwich? Sandwich, like a... I like to say out here. For McDonald's? Oh, is it making you feel gross now? I mean, if it was filling and tasty enough, I'd say... That's fine, you know? But if it's making you feel gross, which is why I don't eat there very often, then that's, uh, not a good. <laughs> yes. I get ya. Um... What I've started doing for ramen to make it a little more exciting is I buy frozen uh, veggies and then um, throw them in and uh, they get hot and liquidized or what do you call it? More hydrated and stuff. An egg or chicken? Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, also, Danica wanted to tell you her hard drive came in. She's very excited. Thank you, sir. Did you ever play the Yoshi story? It's a very short uh, game, but it's still fun. And this was um, obviously one of my favorite levels, because uh, Bone Dragons, yeah. Yeah, so, um, I think it started off, was it Super Mario Brothers 4, where it turns into Yoshi's Island, because most of it doesn't even have, I mean, it just has baby Mario, so. And then they're like, we want to have that on the N64, so they made Yoshi's Story. And that's how it worked. It's like a um, super happy until you get to the final levels. They're very hard. 
and uh, kind of gruesome, like there's a bunch of blades that, uh, and knives coming out of the walls that try to kill you and stuff. Yeah. It is a fun game. I think you guys would enjoy it. Although the so the booze castle is very difficult as well. Um something that happens our replay button or restart button on the N64 broke, so um we didn't know if you permanently lost certain Yoshis, so there's black and white Yoshi. They're like special unlocks you get from certain maps. Um, but uh, we unplug the N64 and plug it back in, because if you die with them, you don't see them again. I heard rumors that you can get them back, but I'm still afraid, so... I will play one of the best songs in a moment. Let me go, um, there's something I gotta do real quick. Very close to finishing. Oh, yes, I was going to play this song. Pop 
So it starts off with one tune and then they change it for each level. So, th so this, this level has this sound. <laughs> version of what? Oh, is that what it's called when you when you use the the same tune and change it? Ah, okay. Yeah, maybe I'll I'll play the original tune so you can hear how it is. No, that's not it. But that's the intro music. Soundtracks that do that. It's pretty amazing how they're able to do that. There's this one called Boneworks, I highly recommend. I might play them on stream actually. So here's the Yoshi song that uses the... So this is how the music starts, and it definitely changes. So here's, I 
think this one's pretty good. Yes, this one's really cute. This one's probably one of the top three, I think. That's okay. Yeah. These musicians are just so amazing at making everything sound... Oh, you're talking about artists in general. Well, everyone has a different creativity in them. It's just depends on what it is you express it through. So yeah. You probably like express it through stuff in games and stuff. Because I know that some people, they don't like drawing, but they work on Minecraft and do all these building and sorting and make awesome stuff. So, yeah. It just. Yeah. That's, that's why I don't think it's like limited to anyone. It's available to everyone, just in different ways. Actually, it's not on my head. I've got a little tripod. Um, I probably can't make it see. Yeah, see? There's the legs. So, it's weird for my phone. So if people try to call me on my phone, I um, can't quite answer while I'm streaming. Okay, um... Well, I tilted it too much, so... Let's see. but I just know that uh, this was free and wanted to try it out. I mean, obviously tripods are free, but... If you're interested in ever trying out a tripod or something, I could let you guys know. Oh, there's a certain song. You say the drawing is almost done, do you mean in like a couple of... Oh, no. It means the percentage-wise, you could say, so. Um, you kind of go through things in stages. See the way the, the colors are pretty light right here and stuff? Yeah, yeah, percentage is probably a better way to think about it because, like, sometimes some areas take so much longer than you think it'll be. So, so like, um... I kind of think of it in terms of passes when it comes to layering things. Um, passes being like how many times you work on something, like a different version of each version. So my first version had um, the background lightly colored. And um, so you, you start off by laying out, kind of like think of color by the numbers, and you want to fill out that area just to get an idea where you want the colors to be. This is after you have all your drawings done, like in graphite. And then once you have the first pass or whatever, um, then you go in and do what I'm doing, which is trying to saturate the paper as much as you can. I mean, as you can tell, there's a lot of uh, graininess and stuff. 
but when you scan it, it's not going to look as shiny, so... That's what I'm hoping, at least. <laughs> but I think it still looks fine, even with the, the shine from the oil. It's funny the way... It, uh, yeah, and so then you erase the graphite, or just color over it if it's dark as you're drawing. So it's kind of like tracing again when you go over with the colored lines. Yeah, just just share it with me once you uh, are able to find what you're looking for. Okay, where's the other one? I'm glad you think so, or I appreciate it. Thank you. This Yoshi's in the wind. Yeah. And then when you're drawing in different areas, um, see, so look at that. That's you trying to not smear your gross human oil all over the paper while you're working because, I mean, it gets all over your hands anyway, but it tries to help it from smearing as much. And then once you're done with everything, you spray it with something called a fixative and it'll keep things from um, smearing anymore. So see here, it's still pretty grainy. That's because I'm going to go over it with uh, another color. But first I need to outline kind of some of the jutting out parts of the rock. Uh, it's a little bit strange looking, but oh well. Okay, let's see what this one is. Oh, this is the other one that I, I really like. Oh, <laughs> there we go. I turned it down now. <laughs> Thank you. I actually have my mic at full, so it's just uh, depending on the music on the computer. There we go. That should do it, I think. Not sure. Look at how much darker when you come in with like a dark gray or black. How much darker the colors turn. Or more solid, you could say.
this part's a bit difficult because I don't want to get the color over everything, but I also don't want to smear my hand. Oh well. That was a very short one. Oh. Heartbeat caverns. Dun 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 dun. Yeah, that's the annoying part. So from here is when it gets spookier music oh wait oh yeah share the link you can share it here or um, through a DM or something Okay, this one is actually, um, I think my third favorite one. It's like a, almost like the Sugar Plum Fairy song, but it's called Baby Bowser's Lullaby. It's okay. Oh, I did too soon. Yeah, I like the way they did that stage. They did a good job. And they have the happy tree that you're saving. I love the the deep bassy sounds. So when hmm. Hmm. Let me see if I can find that one. Yoshi stage smash Bros. 64. Um. Well, 
I have a Wii U one, huh? Here it is. Okay, ten years ago. Oh, are they gonna play all those sounds in the game? Yeah, it sounds like just like a slightly more probably to make it more fast paced like Smash. And then if you look at the background, it's like everything's patchwork. That's how most of Yoshi's story is. Like everything looks like it was hen, you know, like crafts almost. <laughs> oh, so it's like a mix of all the songs. So that's the the ending song. Ding! Yeah, it's definitely much slower in the normal game. And then you go to this one, I think the ending song that they played a clip of. No, that's wrong. I think it's this one? No. No, that's wrong. Is this it? I'm trying to f find... The riddle? No. Let's try it. No. Hard times. Happy together. Come on, let's find it. Uh, is it the? Oh yeah, some reason this playlist doesn't have the ending song. Yoshi story ending theme. Apparently they added it in uh, Smash Ultimate. It would be so fun to learn this on guitar. I want to learn the most on guitar is Gerudo's Valley. That song sounds amazing. Now here, here come the Yoshi singing the end.
See, this is what minions wish they could be if they were cute. They're not cute, and Yoshi's also not annoying. Unless he spams egg throws at you. Oh yeah, or if he eats you and then jumps off the cliff. That one's fun. Hooray! Yeah, woo, yeah, woohoo! Yeah, the end! Okay, let me let me color this one and then it actually will be the end, so. And then you go like this. Oh no, it's su Super Mario World 2. Okay, so that's where that happens. So gray is cursed because it likes to uh, break on me a lot, so that's always really cool. I've had this colored pencil for like a week and it's already this short, so it's kind of annoying. Uh-oh. Okay, I think that should do it for the mid-ground. I think it looks alright. Um, kinda. Maybe those guys are too blue, but that's okay. Um, how do I show a less shiny version? I don't think you can. Anyway, thank you guys for showing up and helping support me. Um, um, thank you for following me too and uh, we'll be back next time not sure when actually but but oh you know whenever whenever that happens so have a goodbye there I mean <laughs> uh, goodbye there that's what I meant to say <laughs>